I want to, this evening, take some time to share with you my insights that I gained from my experience serving in the World Center about where the faith is and where it is going and what I see to be some of the opportunities we now face. And I begin by calling to your attention a point you may already be well aware of, which is the fact that one of the great philosophic contributions of the Baha'i teachings is that it has brought mankind back to a realization that the material and spiritual worlds are two intertwined components of one whole, that they are not antagonists, as has become the view of so many contemporary theologies, but rather we see human beings as dwelling at one and the same time in both the spiritual and material worlds, and that all our actions have content materially and spiritually. Beyond that, my understanding of the Baha'i teachings is that the material world is governed by certain laws and principles which we uncover in physics, chemistry, biology and other sciences. That the material world is governed by certain principles which have their analogue in the spiritual realm. And that we can therefore gain insight into the operation of spiritual forces by studying the analogue to the material world. Take, for example, the principle of magnetism, which has become a familiar concept in the material world. We have some idea what magnets are, how they work, what constitute a magnet, and what a magnet does. Lo and behold, we find that Abdul Baha and the Guardian, and to some extent the Universal House of Justice, in writing or speaking of spiritual concepts, use magnetism as an analogy with which to describe profound spiritual principles. Likewise, the concept of evolution, the concept of an organic unit, these concepts which arise in the study of the material world provide useful vehicles of thought with which to examine and explore spiritual concepts. I make this point because I believe there are two quite important developments in our understanding of the material world which provide a means for gaining further insight into the Baha'i teachings. And I want to begin tonight by briefly discussing these two concepts and from there proceeding to seeing their application in the understanding of the Baha'i teachings. The first physical concept which I think has great bearing on our understanding of the operation of the Baha'i faith is what is called in the physical world the concept of non-linearity. Now what does this mean? Very simply, and physicists in the audience will cringe at this explanation, <laughs> very simply, as I understand it, we think unconsciously of the world as a linear world. And a linear world is one in which a small cause produces a small effect. If you want a big effect, you need a big cause. If one person can, live 50 pound, can lift 50 pounds, you need 10 people to lift 500 pounds, 100 people to, live, to lift 5,000 pounds, and so on. Our concept of the world and its operation and what happens in it is governed by our general perception that the world is linear. Small things produce small effects, big things produce big effects. Now it has become clear that this concept of a linear world is 
in many instances invalid. To, in some instances it is a useful approximation, in other instances not so. It has become quite clear over recent years to physical scientists that the world is essentially non-linear. And what does that mean? It means that in certain instances in the physical world a very small force will produce a vast change. Looking at it in greater detail, mathematicians find that it depends upon what they call initial conditions. And what that means is that if you have a very, very small force subject to the right conditions, whatever they are, subject to the right conditions, you can achieve a vast transformation in effect. This has become a very fashionable and very intriguing concept recently. The most recent meeting of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science was devoted almost entirely to this subject and to a derivative of it called chaos theory and fractal mathematics and all kinds of other things that we need not worry about. But in the main, the understanding of the physical world, of the biological world, and now of the world of social sciences is being revolutionized by the realization that the world is basically non-linear. The things which formerly seemed mysterious, random, unpredictable, are in fact due to small forces small changes applied at the right time and under the right conditions and in the right place. And the implications on that of our understanding of the universe are far from fully explored. The other physical concept that I think has great relevance to our understanding of the Baha'i faith is again the realization in recent years that the world around us is not as it seems, that it is basically, the material world is basically energized by unseen forces operating in a way which appears to defy common sense. Physicists looking deeply into the operation of the material world have come up with a vast apparatus of concepts of forces, of weak forces and strong forces, and electromagnetic forces and gravitons and quantum mechanical concepts and all kinds of things which at first sight don't seem to fit in with what we have learnt from experience but which generally now are accepted to be true in the light of their ability to explain and their ability to predict new phenomena it has become clear that our sense perception of the world around us is invalid. That deep beyond our sense perception is a world of forces operating in ways that don't fit in with our generally accepted understanding and which stretch our credulity. So, the material world, the world of physics, of biology and of the social sciences is in great flux, is subject to tremendous change and revolution under the impact of these two relatively new principles. The application of the principle of non-linearity that sometimes small forces at the right time in the right place produce vast effects and the, the realization that the world we perceive is much more than it looks, that it is subject to mysterious forces which don't fit in with conventional views of common sense. I mention this because to me it is an example of the way in which the world is moving in the direction of making the Baha'i claims appear far more reasonable 
than they did to the casual observer even a few years ago. In the coming of Baha'u'llah, we see the principle of non-linearity operating par excellence. The appearance of his revelation at the right time, in the right place, under the right conditions, in an obscure part of the world, buried in the 19th century, is now transforming the affairs of mankind, creating great institutions, changing the world of today, and even more, the world of tomorrow. What greater example could there be of non-linearity than the dynamics of the operation and growth of the Baha'i community? Likewise, our concept of the world, of the spiritual world, is analogous to the concept of the physical world. We see in the spiritual world, the world beyond that of matter, the operation of forces which have been released in the world, which are changing it, and the understanding of those forces is essential to a satisfying and comprehensive view of where we are, where we are going, and what life is all about. So in this way, we see the world changing before our eyes in ways which bring it closer and closer to the concepts embedded in the Baha'i teachings. Some I think almost two years ago, a leading social scientist visited the World Center and he met with a number of Baha'is who were appointed to talk to him by the House of Justice. And when they discussed some of these scientific concepts, at one time he sat back and put his pen on the table and said Baha'u'llah was the, the forerunner of all system science, the leading system scientist. Well, we, of course, would never chosen to categorize Baha'u'llah in that way, but nevertheless it was an indication to me of how these Baha'i concepts are becoming more acceptable to society with the growth and the evolution of understanding of sciences. I mention all of these things because my view is that we Baha'is are today at a very critical and very important time in the development of the faith and that the activities we will carry out within the next few years will have a far-reaching effect on the faith which may determine its condition perhaps for a century ahead. And I want to explore this theme with you this evening. From my perspective in serving at the Holy Land, it's become apparent to me that while every time in mankind is a time of great change, the changes that are occurring before our eyes over the past two or three years are far more fundamental, far more far-reaching than at any time previously in contemporary history. The political changes the realignment of powers, the changes in ideology, the disillusionment of people with what they regarded as certainties, foundations for their intellectual and political and social life is profound and pervasive in all continents of the world at the present time. The economic and social changes are without precedent. Solutions which worked quite well for decades are now found not to work. People who were sure of themselves as government leaders, as leaders of thought, as statesmen, as philosophers, thinkers of various kinds, now are admitting that they are bewildered and unable to comprehend what are the solutions that mankind needs. This lack of confidence is without precedent. Until the last two or three years, it seems to me, there were an abundance of people, 
writing books, giving speeches, giving talks in various parts of the world, offering their solutions with confidence to what they perceive to be the problems of mankind, that confidence is largely lost. I often think of a passage of the Guardian in the latter part of the advent of divine justice which in paraphrase in referring to the United States of America says that the American government and people are being moved by forces they can neither comprehend nor control and I think this model of forces moving a nation, moving a people, moving through a society as a result of the coming of Baha'u'llah is applicable not only to America but to all parts of the world. And the record of world events over the last year, two years, three years is a dramatic example of these forces at work in the world changing it before our eyes. As you know, one of the exciting events foreshadowed in the Baha'i writings is the coming of the lesser peace. We have statements of the Guardian which tell us that Abdul Baha anticipated the coming of the lesser peace by the end of this secular century. And that time is approaching rapidly. Eleven years remain. I believe this is the appropriate perspective with which to view the fundamental transformations in politics, in social thought, in economic conditions in, in the world occurring before our eyes. The forces released by the coming of Baha'u'llah are working through human society, are breaking down barriers which previously were regarded as impregnable, part of the hastening process leading mankind to the condition of the lesser peace in the very, very short time remaining. Our role as Baha'is is crucial in this process. Let me recall to your attention the words of the Universal House of Justice written some 20 years ago and in the book Wellspring of Guidance where the House of Justice referred to the coming of the lesser peace and said at that time mankind would be like a unified body. And in that message the House of Justice went on to point out that the role of the Baha'is in the spread of the Baha'i teachings and the growth of the Baha'i community the role of the Baha'is is to breathe spirit into the unified body of mankind. And if we fail in this process, that body, although unified, will be inert. It is in that sense that our role accelerates as the process of change accelerates with the rapid approach of the end of the 20th century bringing in its train the coming of the lesser peace. Our role is crucial. Our role is to act as agents of the divine will to breathe spirit into this unified body of mankind which is being born before our eyes in present day political events and the events which are to occur in the next 11 years. It is in that sense that I see the role of the believers as vital in the years between now and the end of the century. As I think I may have said before on another occasion in speaking in this hall, it's the story of Genesis repeated, the symbolic story of, in Genesis of God taking clay and from it molding a human form, breathing spirit into it and it came to life. Well, we don't take this literally, we take it symbolically. And that symbolism is applicable today. The clay of mankind is being molded into a unified body which will come into being with the coming of the lesser peace. And our role is to be the agents of the divine will to breathe spirit as occurred in the symbolism of Genesis to breathe spirit into that unified body. It is in this sense that I see our role as vital. 
Some years ago, the Guardian, writing to the Baha'is in the West and specifically to the Baha'is in North America, referred to the onset of a period of testing and opposition in the faith. And he said quite categorically that this would occur in the Western world as in the Eastern world. And we are well aware of this now for two reasons. One is the resurgence of persecution in the past decade in a physical form in the cradle of the faith, Iran. And secondly, the fact that the House of Justice has told us in recent years that the faith on a global scale has emerged from obscurity and we all know from the seven stages of the growth of the faith described by the Guardian in Advent of Divine Justice and in God Passes By that it goes through the stages, the first of which is obscurity, the second of which is persecution and repression. So for these and other reasons we might well anticipate that the Baha'i community in the West as well as in the East must prepare itself for a period of testing. It is my considered view that that period of testing, of persecution, is not in the future in the West, but is here now. I say this because I read in the writings of the Guardian and his quote, quoting of the statements of Abdul Baha the references to the fact that in the Western world this testing, this opposition if you will to the spread of the faith will be primarily mental rather than physical. And the one point I want to make to you tonight the one point I hope to leave you with is my belief, my conviction, if you will, that that period of mental testing is not some abstract nebulous thing in the future which will one day descend upon us in the Western world, but it is something that quietly, unexpectedly and unobtrusively has come upon us now and that we are now in the midst of this period of testing of which Abdul Baha spoke and which the Guardian foreshadowed. Why do I say this? I say this because my perception of Western society is that it has changed dramatically in recent years. The idealism of the 1960s and early 70s is absent. Remember the turbulence of the American scene of those years. The protest, the civil rights marches, the movement for the equality of the sexes, the anti-Vietnam protest, the ecology passions, all of those things, where are they now? That idealism, sometimes misguided, sometimes destructive, sometimes self-defeating, that idealism has gone. And the Western world has settled into a complacency, a self-centeredness, a self-absorption, an apathy about the condition of the larger society and the future of mankind, and an overall sense of short-sightedness about the direction of the future of the individual and of society. The Western world has changed. And my fear is that we are subject to a great and crucial period of testing at the present time because we face the real danger of becoming infected with these attitudes which have become accepted throughout the West. That period of idealism of the 60s, with all its turmoil, with all its passion, with all its turbulence, was a period 
in which the Baha'i community was also distinguished by its idealism, by its energy, by its passion and indeed its turbulence. Now in the late 1980s, when the society is distinguished by apathy, self-centeredness and short-sightedness, now is not the time for the Baha'is to become infected with those attitudes. If we do, we will have failed the test, the mental test of which Abdul Baha spoke and which the Guardian foreshadowed. I remember several years ago participating in a Baha'i discussion in which the believers present generally agreed that the mental tests were in many ways more dangerous than physical tests because with the physical test you would know immediately who was doing it and what he or she was doing to you with the mental tests you wouldn't know until perhaps it was too late and I remind you of this principle at this time because I fear that the Baha'i communities in the West as well as in other parts of the world are facing the challenge of these mental tests creeping up on them, sapping their energy, innovating them, rendering them apathetic, self-centered and short-sighted without their realizing it until it is too late. And it is for this reason that I lay emphasis upon this point that I want as much as possible to ask that you remember this point if you forget the rest of what I say, that you think about it, that you meditate on this, that you look in the writings to find either support or disproof of what I say, and that if you find it acceptable, you take whatever steps you feel appropriate to protect yourself about, against what I see to be a very virulent, very subtle, and very dangerous mental test. What can we do in the face of this test of a subtlety the like of which the faith has never before faced in its 145 years of history? How can we defend ourselves? How can we protect ourselves against such, a, such an insidious mental test? I believe we must begin by reaffirming and re-emphasizing as never before the spiritual basis of our religion, by returning to those spiritual disciplines which throughout recorded history have been the foundation of religion. The concept of prayer transforming it far beyond the mere recitation of words. Fervent, devoted, yearning, beseeching, supplicating prayer. The refreshment and nourishment that we gain from the period of fasting each year. The sense of discipline required to read and meditate upon a portion of the creative word every day, day in, day out, week after week, month after month, year after year. The bringing of the human soul in contact with the creative word of the manifestation of God for this age. The concept of the spiritual element of sacrificial contribution to the fund, the vast effort and discipline, the pain and suffering inherent in character development, in reviving the, the moral, the ethical, the principles which underlie good character and the refinement of human conduct. I believe that in the face of this mental test, 
which is pervading us like a cloud, we must stand strong and make an even greater effort than ever before to cling even more deeply to these spiritual virtues, these spiritual disciplines and practices which are the foundation of religion, be it the Christian religion, the Jewish religion, the, the Muslim, the Babi, the Baha'i religion. We must become and see ourselves not simply as people of a new social order, not pe simply as people aiming to bring about the oneness of the races and the equality of the sexes and the harmony of religion and science. We must see ourselves and nurture ourselves as Baha'is who are people of religion. People of religion who are primarily concerned with spiritual values, spiritual spiritual virtues, spiritual development, spiritual practices. I see this as a foundation of our traversing this very dangerous period in the evolution of the faith when our communities, and particularly that in this country which is so much the engine of the Baha'i world, that traverse this period of dangerous and insidious mental tests. I recall, as many of you no doubt do, a story attributed to Abdul Baha of an occasion when an early pilgrim called Anis Rideout came to the presence of the Master and asked him what was the best way to develop oneself spiritually. And as I recall the answer provided by Abdul Baha, it included some of the things I mentioned, prayer, meditation on the Holy Word, fasting and the like. And it included one more thing, which I initially found very surprising and indeed somewhat repellent. Abdul Baha, if my memory serves me right, said to Anis Rideout that she should pray and meditate and read the Holy Writings. In addition, he said to her, if I recall, that it was important to meditate on the afterlife. And that was the part I found repellent. I said to myself, this is not like one of those religions which sort of gives you a spiritual bribery and says, do all these things so you'll be very comfortable after that, after you die. This is a religion which is concerned with creating the ever-advancing civilization, solving the social ills of mankind, creating a better world, not giving people spiritual bribes so they'll be nice and quiet and obedient and they'll have a good time in the next world. Now, as I've hopefully somewhat matured, or at least got older, maybe matured, um, I see a new dimension to what Abdul Baha has said in response to the question from this pilgrim because I see meditation on the afterlife not as something intrinsically morbid or depressing or negative but rather as something positive and constructive and developmental not as something which would restrict the creativity and diversity of behavior but as something which would enhance it. It is in this sense that I call your attention to what I understand to have been the admonition of Abdul Baha that as an important element of our personal spiritual lives we should meditate on the afterlife. And what do I understand from this? I understand that we should remain conscious as much as possible that we are in many ways living in the transit lounge. <laughs> we are en route from one place to another and the place we are going to is 
we are told a world with the potential for glory without end for a degree of happiness and fulfillment far beyond our comprehension and we as believers if we fix our goal on the fact that we are in transit that we are pilgrims on our way to a distant horizon beyond the dimensions of the physical life then we will steer our life aright we will determine the appropriate priorities we will avoid that horror one sometimes encounters of an elderly person in the evening of his or her life who feels a sense of emptiness a sense of frustration of disappointment and loss and who even worse does not know what it is they lost what it is they did not achieve what it is they did not find it is in this sense that i see vast wisdom and vast practical guidance in the admonition of the master that a part of our spiritual practice should be this wholesome constructive and developmental meditation on the afterlife i want to take a few minutes before i conclude and address any questions you may wish to pose to touch upon one more element of my theme and that is some of the more specific needs which the and opportunities that the bahai community faces at the present time as i have said i believe that we are at this very crucial time in history when we are called upon to be the agent whereby spirit is to be breathed into the clay body of mankind being unified before our eyes in the turbulent events leading to the lesser peace in that sense there will never be a time like this in the next century it won't be like this the lesser peace will have come into being the body will have been born spirit will be flowing within it great tasks will remain the development of mankind its further spiritualization the raising of great institutions the construction of the world order of bahawala the most great peace the raising of the world civilization and so on but there will never be a time like this when we stand at the hinge of history called upon to take responsibility to breathe spirit into this unified body being called into being in front of us i think we can best perceive the significance of the period in which we live by examining the lessons of history by looking to the early christians as they contemplated the spiritual conquest of rome and asia minor and north africa and further regions did they realize that lay, they were laying the foundation for 2000 years of civilization the early followers of muhammad when they came down from medina to mecca and made a pact and invited muhammad to come back to transfer his residence to medina did they realize the significance of what they were doing that from that favorable environment in medina the muslim faith would take root would flourish would grow would ultimately conquer mecca and the arabian subcontinent and then the whole of the mediterranean and middle eastern world were they aware of that i think not and so it is not simply in religious history but in secular history when the barons gathered around king john at runnymede in 1215 and extracted from him the magna carta did they realize the foundations of what they were laying for the future of civilized life for centuries to come did the formulators of the declaration of independence and the the constructors of the constitution of the united states did they realize 
what future effect they would have not only on this nation but on the concept of democracy throughout the world? I think not. And so it is today. Do we as this generation realize the significance of what we will do in the next 11 years for the whole course of the lesser peace for the timetable by which the most great peace will ultimately come and the world civilization come into being we do not we do not know what is the significance and the effect of what is before us all we can do is to strive inadequately but with as much devotion and energy as possible to see what is before us to summon up our energies, to overcome the innovation of the environment around us and to commit ourselves with faith to these pursuits, confident that they will yield a remarkable fruit far beyond our comprehension. At this time, I see the Baha'i world as engaged in three kinds of activities which are interdependent and all of which are of historic significance. And let me mention them briefly before I conclude. The first of these three activities is centered at the Baha'i World Center and is, as you might well imagine, revolving around what we call the ARC project. And what is this project? What is it all about? Is it simply our self-aggrandizement by constructing beautiful buildings in a Greek form with marble and timber and, and the like? Is it more than that? Obviously it is. How can we appreciate the significance of the ARC project? While I, of course, as the rest of us, find the messages of the House of Justice inspiring and educational, I think the real significance of the ARC project to me is not found in the messages of the House of Justice or indeed in any of the Baha'i writings. I see the real significance of the ARC project in the book of Isaiah because it is there that I read of the mountain of the Lord and of God coming and administering justice on his mountain and the river of laws flowing out and the transformation of society. I see the Ark project in the book of Revelations where St. John has the vision of God descending from heaven and wiping away the tears of the faithful and dwelling with them and being their God forevermore. I see the Ark project in the Quran where God speaking through the revelation of Muhammad refers to the believers, the faithful, each sitting upon a throne of justice in that day. It is in these sacred books of ancient prophecy that I see the Ark Project because I see in the Ark Project the fulfillment of those promises of the establishment of the presence of God and the operation of the divine will on the mountain of the Lord. And this, I think, is the real significance of what we are going to accomplish in the next few years. We are doing much more than building a set of buildings. We are establishing the seat of the world administrative order, evolving into the world order of Baha'u'llah, the promised one of all ages, the inaugurator of the day that will not be followed by night, the inaugurator of a world civilization that will flourish for 500,000 years. This is what we are doing in these few years. We are the generation to do it, not the generation to come after us. It'll be too late. It's to be done by the end of this century. The Guardian said certain processes must synchronize and that the establishment of the administrative order on Mount Carmel would synchronize with the coming of the lesser peace. This is the time, there is no escape, there is no postponement possible. Prophecies of thousands of years going back to Isaiah and even earlier are now before our eyes in this decade and beyond being fulfilled. And in that sense, the ARC project stands before us 
as something that generations for thousands upon thousands of years in the future will contemplate with awe and wonder at what was accomplished by so few believers scattered over the surface of the earth at this period. Together with the administrative development as one of the three elements of Baha'i activity at the present time, together with, I'm sorry, together with the World Center development as one of the three elements of Baha'i activity at the present time, there is the administrative development which I find equally exciting and equally as significant. And what do I mean by the administrative development? What I mean is this. It's our emphasis has been on the formation of the basic structure of the administrative order. More local assemblies, eventually getting some national assemblies. Ultimately, the election and re-election of the Universal House of Justice. Hands of the cause, auxiliary board members, then in the absence of appointment of further hands of the cause, members of continental boards of councillors, assistance to the auxiliary board members, and then ultimately the International Teaching Centre. That basic structure is now complete. There will, of course, be f further developments. There will be a lot more local assemblies in the world. There will be some more national assemblies, not a whole lot more because we're running out of countries, but certainly some more. There will presumably be more councillors and more auxiliary board members and probably a whole lot more assistance. But the structure is basically complete. Our administrative development at the present time is focused principally, it seems, upon interrelationships of these elements. It's a bit like embryology. First comes a basic form of the skeleton of what is to become the, the, the newborn being. Then when that basic form is in place, although it continues to, to expand, the emphasis seems to shift to the interrelationship between the elements of that form. And it's really a turning point in the development of the embryo when that occurs. This seems to be the point we're at now. The shape of the future world order of Baha'u'llah is in place, although it will continue to expand. And the emphasis now in our administrative development seems to be on interrelationships. The relationship, the closer cooperation between the two arms of the administrative order, the overcoming of all the natural uh, concerns and suspicions and wariness and territoriality and the like. The uh, development of cooperation between national spiritual assemblies to a greater extent than before. And here we are being propelled forward by the continent of Europe because in the continent of Europe we have 21 national spiritual assemblies living literally within a stone's throw of each other and in a continent which is itself moving towards greater interdependence with 1992 and the breakdown of barriers in the European economic community. All of that is providing an appropriate crucible in which to develop new forms of inter-NSA cooperation and coordination which will be a model for other continents where the nations are geographically more spread as in the Americas and Asia and Africa and Australasia. The expansion of the International Teaching Centre will I think be seen as something that had a new phase in this year of 1988 just passed when the membership of the teaching centre was increased to include nine councillors. This will, I think, be seen as a milestone because the International Teaching Centre is developing by leaps and bounds. The members of the House of Justice look upon the teaching centre as a loving parent would look upon their favourite child we look at the teaching centre and we say, with what I hope is not a spiritually destructive pride, this is ours. 
we brought this into being. Look at its creativity. Look at its innovation. Look at the new initiatives it's proposing. Look at its ideas. Look at the measures it's taken to stimulate the quality of Baha'i life and the quality of Baha'i teaching activity. The teaching center is taking an enormous amount of new initiatives, most of which have had no effect whatsoever at the present time because it's too soon. Give it one or two more years and you'll realize what I'm saying now because in one or two years time these new initiatives will have matured, will have been perfected and developed appropriately by the teaching center and then will be offered through the councils to the Baha'i world and then you'll look back, you'll say, ah, now I understand what Peter was talking about that night. Now I see these wonderful things the teaching center is doing. Another important element of administrative development that I see occurring at the present time is the labor being expended at the World Center in the translation of the Katabi Actus and the provision of copiously, a copious number of annotations to that most holy book. I classify this not simply as a development in the quality of Baha'i life, but in the quality of Baha'i administration. Because when the Katabi Actus is released to the Baha'i world, although it is to the discretion of the House of Justice to decide when and at what time the laws of the Actus are to be applied, it won't necessarily be with the release of the book, that's something for the House to decide. Nevertheless, I think with the release of the Katabi Actus, translated and suitably annotated to the Baha'i world by the end of the six-year plan in 1992, the spiritual significance of that event cannot be comprehended. Perhaps it will mark a new stage in the rule of law in human affairs in the regulation of human behavior by the precepts of law, and in this case, spiritual law. We can only speculate. What we can say is that the fiber of our administrative order, of our Baha'i community governed by its administrative institutions, that fiber, the quality of the Baha'i community will, it seems to me, begin a new and accelerated phase in its strengthening and development as a result of the spiritual impact of the release of the Katabi Actus now being worked on in the Holy Land. The third and final element I want to mention as far as the activities of the faith concerns teaching. As you know, the House of Justice in its Rizvan message referred to new opportunities for teaching the faith, a new paradigm, new prospects for the development and expansion of the Baha'i community. And as I've thought about this in the months ahead and observed the reports we receive at the World Centre of the growth of the Baha'i community, I might tell you that the World Centre is at the present time a very exciting place. It's very exciting because of the information we receive from the believers about the growth of the faith. That being said, I want to also caution you that to us, big numbers are not as important as big effort. The one occasion I can recall when the World Center as a whole seemed to celebrate and almost literally dance with joy was a report from Iceland of ten new believers over a period of several weeks. Now in terms of numbers and the quarter million who've joined since Rizvan or whatever, ten is minuscule. Why did that cause such unbridled joy because we knew how difficult it is and has been to teach the faith in Iceland. And we knew that ten new believers in Iceland was little short of a miracle of heroic effort. And it was for that that we celebrated. And it wasn't the celebration of a patronizing attitude, you know, or those poor silly Icelanders, they happened to enroll somebody. It was rather the celebration 
that something very wonderful had occurred that believers in as remote an area as Iceland had summoned up their resources to make the Herculean effort required to bring ten new believers into the cause. So when I tell you that the World Centre is at the present time a t- in a very exciting period of the victories of the teaching the faith, you should also remember that we are celebrating this, these victories with as much insight as we can into the effort that goes into them rather than into the n- numerical achievements. It seems to me that with the movement of mankind towards the end of the century and the coming of the lesser peace with the uh, strength of the Baha'i community with the spiritual forces released because of the heroism of the Baha'is in Iran and their resolute steadfastness with all of these things going on deep spiritual forces are at work in the world mysterious forces that we cannot comprehend are moving in the hearts of mankind. There is a receptivity out there such as we have never seen. People who you might otherwise dismiss as being unreceptive, uninterested in something as outlandish as a religion that you can't even spell its name, all these kinds of things. Such people are finding their hearts stirred deeply by the spiritual content of the Baha'i religion and are moving towards it. Something very strange is going on. And I say this not idly. Something very mysterious is happening in the world. I think it only started to happen very recently. I don't know when, but I think it was no more than two or three years ago. Something started to occur in the world. Some spiritual forces were released by the will of Baha'u'llah and mankind is being changed to a greater condition of receptivity such as we have never seen before. One of the things that brings me great joy as a member of the House of Justice, one of the new members, is to see the excitement of those valiant souls who have served on the House of Justice since 1963 and to hear them say again and again that in all their years on the House of Justice since 1963 they have never known a period like this when the spirit of teaching was so alive throughout the length and breadth of the Baha'i world. There were times before of great excitement, the large-scale enrollments in India, the work in Bolivia, the Mentaway Islands in Peru and in other areas in Uganda and Kenya and so on. But there never before, I am told by my more senior colleagues, there never before was a time when the spirit of teaching was alive universally throughout the Baha'i community. Our challenge in the face of this unprecedented opportunity to teach the faith, our challenge is to have faith. Our challenge is to have faith in the process of change. Because with the large receptivity to the faith, as these friends enter the Baha'i community, the Baha'i community will change. There will be a whole lot of people around who we didn't know before. It may not feel as comfortable. It may not feel as familiar. They may be very different people from different social groups and classes and backgrounds and so on. Our challenge in teaching the faith, in taking advantage of the receptivity, is to have faith. To have faith in the process of change. That this change in the Baha'i community, which will come about with the large-scale enrollments that lie ahead of us, that this change will be a good thing for us individually as well as for the Baha'i community, that we as individuals will feel even more fulfilled, even more happy, even more comfortable, even more at home and at ease 
as this large number of people enter our Baha'i community. So that is why I say that I believe that one of the great challenges before us in rising to the opportunity to enroll people who are receptive into the Baha'i faith, one of the great challenges is to have faith in the process of change to which the head of the faith is now calling us. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak on the subject of women and peace. And I want to begin by addressing the issue of why it is that such a subject is treated. What is the connection between women and peace? I think that connection is found in some very unusual and very striking statements from the world centre of the faith. For example, Abdul Baha has written, When the equality of men and women shall be realised, the foundation of war will be utterly destroyed. Without equality, this is impossible. And more recently, the Universal House of Justice, in their statement, The Promise of World Peace, wrote, The emancipation of women the achievement of full equality between the sexes is one of the most important, though less acknowledged, prerequisites of peace. What I understand from these statements is that there are two very basic questions in the world. One is the achievement of the equality of men and women, the other the attainment of world peace. And these statements from Abdul Baha and from the House of Justice ally these two issues ally them and moreover point out that one is a prerequisite to the other. It follows from that that with our concern for the achievement of world peace we must necessarily direct our attention somewhat to the question of the equality of men and women and how this is to be realised through the power and influence of the Baha'i teachings. So tonight I want to consider three principal issues. Firstly, the question of the equality of men and women. Secondly, the linkage between the role of women and the achievement of peace. And thirdly and briefly, the means that are open to the Baha'i community to foster the implementation of this equality. We do this in context of the present day environment where the world around us exhibits a wide spectrum of views. On the one extreme, the rise and growing influence of conservative fundamentalism in religion and in philosophy, which is largely antagonistic to the granting of greater rights to women, and on the other extreme, anti-male fanaticism with the extreme fringe of the feminist movement. We also must consider this question in context of the fact that the Universal House of Justice has in its statement on peace offered the world Baha'i community as a model for the achievement of unity and has warned us that with our emergence from obscurity more and more shrewd, sceptical and even suspicious people will scrutinise the Baha'i community, will examine our record of achievement and behaviour in an attempt to find discrepancy between statements of our teachings and our present day practice. So all of these are the context with which we examine the question of the equality of men and women and the efforts being made by the worldwide Baha'i community to put it into practice. I want to begin by spending some time making a brief historical survey of the status and treatment of women down through the ages. And one might say, well, why do this? Why don't we just examine the Baha'i teachings and see what they say? My response to that question is that I think it is useful for us to look at the manner in which women have been treated historically because it provides a backdrop with which to adequately view and appreciate the Baha'i principles, to appreciate their novelty, their significance and their far-reaching consequence. It also enables us 
to better comprehend the challenge we face as Baha'is to bring about the implementation of our principles in a non-Baha'i environment which largely functions according to a different approach. Let me begin by looking over a sense of history at the manner in which women have been regarded from a historical perspective. This, of course, is a controversial subject. There are some people who feel that women have been treated quite badly through history. There are others who maintain that this is an exaggeration, that in fact it hasn't been quite so bad. And one can find at times disagreement, even argument, in the larger society and perhaps even within the Baha'i community over the manner in which women have been treated down through history. Well, this question is very easily resolved. It's resolved by our turning to the authoritative statements of Abdul Baha and seeing what he says about the manner in which women have been treated over the course of history. And let me read to you two passages from Abdul Baha on this subject. Firstly, he says, In past ages, it was held that woman and man were not equal. That is to say, woman was considered inferior to man, even from the standpoint of her anatomy and creation. She was considered especially inferior in intelligence, and the idea prevailed universally that it was not allowable for her to step into the arena of important affairs. In some countries, men went so far as to believe and teach that woman belonged to a sphere lower than human. And one more of the many passages from Abdul Baha on this subject, he said, Formerly in India, Persia and throughout the Orient, she, that is woman, was not considered a human being. Certain Arab tribes counted their women in with their livestock. In their language, the noun for woman also meant donkey. That is the same name applied to both, and a man's wealth was accounted by the number of these beasts of burden he possessed. The worst insult one could hurl at a man was to cry out, Thou woman! In former times it was considered wiser that woman should not know how to read or write. She should occupy herself only with drudgery. So we can see that Abdul Baha has very clearly and very succinctly expressed to us the manner in which women have been generally treated down through the ages. Why did Abdul Baha write this? What does he mean with these very strong statements that I have read? I think when we look at the record of history, we find that the manner in which inequality has been expressed concerning women can be categorized into a number of images or a number of historical views about women. For example, one view in history was woman as being inferior, allied with Mother Nature, woman as a source of fertility, having access to a mysterious, uncontrollable power, woman used for, to sacrifice the forces of nature. We see this in the great uh, mother goddesses of antiquity and in the analogies used in the Old Testament in the Song of Solomon. Woman was regarded as having a mysterious power to be controlled with taboos and purification rites. Another historical view in which woman was treated as unequal was woman as enchantress as an agent of evil expressed through the use of sexuality to cause the downfall of man by his seduction from the exalted purposes of his life. Hence women were to be veiled and confined because of their sexual promiscuity. We see this today, echoes of it in the treatment of rape victims where quite often the defense is that the woman brought it on herself. She had it coming, the way she behaved or the way she dressed. 
Another view was woman as inferior, as a different mode of being, irrational, moody, emotional, not capable of receiving education. Another unequal expression of the treatment of woman, and quite often found in orthodox religion, was woman as a model of virtue, pious, virginal, obedient, meek and submissive to the male, occupied entirely with domestic work, with no legal or political power, and a woman who refers all questions which have any intellectual element to them to a man, to her husband, her father or her brother. This view, of course, pertained over a great deal of recorded history and became embodied even in some legal codes. The Napoleonic Civil Code in France in 1804 said those persons without rights at law are minors, married women, criminals and the mentally deficient. Women had no rights at law under the Napoleonic Code of 1904. Schopenhauer wrote that women should be under restriction and by their very nature they require a guardian and that they are made for obedience. So these various and other views of women were ways in which inequality was expressed. What has religion done about this? Again, we find the subject to be controversial. When we look at the role of religion in the treatment of women, there is again a wide spectrum of views, and once again we turn to the sacred and authoritative writings of our religion for guidance. Examining these Baha'i texts, I find three basic principles which help me to understand the way in which women have been treated in religion. The first is expressed in a statement of Baha'u'llah, where he says, women and men have been and will always be equal in the sight of God. So one principle, equality in the sight of God. The second principle is that of women having greater moral courage. Abdul Baha says, the woman has greater moral courage than the man. She has also special gifts which enable her to govern in moments of danger and crisis. And the third principle is that religions historically have placed men above women. Abdul Baha says, He, that is Baha'u'llah, establishes the equality of man and woman. This is peculiar to the teachings of Baha'u'llah, for all other religions have placed man above woman. So, three principles. Equality in the sight of God, woman having greater moral courage, and all religions have placed man above woman. These three principles, I believe, are the foundation to illuminate examination of the way in which religions have treated women. We find, for example, on the question of equality in the sight of God, we can look in the authentic texts of the major religions of the world and find wonderful statements expressing this spiritual equality in the words of the manifestations of God where those words are extant in authentic form. So this equality is found in the Quran, in passages in the New Testament, in Galatians, as well as in other sacred books. The second principle is that of moral courage. Abdu'l-Bahá says woman has greater moral courage than man. And when we look at religious history, we find that women have played a disproportionate role in the early days of each religion, giving it strength, conviction and governance. For example, consider the role of Mary Magdalene in Christianity, the role of Khadija in her support of Muhammad in the early days of his dispensation and Fatima's courage in support of Muhammad when he was subject to great persecution. Look at the record of Tahre, Nawab, Bahia Khanum in the time of Abdul Baha and the Guardian. Bahia Khanum's courageous support to Abdul Baha and the Guardian, her governance. 
for a temporary period in the early days of the guardianship. In these and other examples in religious history, we find this moral courage of which Abdu'l-Bahá speaks. And the third principle, that religions have placed man above woman. I think we have to here dis distinguish between social principles and spiritual value. Certainly when we look at the various religions of the world, we find there was a social distinction between men and women due to the prevailing social conditions or mores of the environment. Men were protectors of women and the like. However, the key issue, I believe, is not that of the social principles in the teachings of the various religions. It is rather that of the spiritual value of men in relationship to women. And here I believe that the record shows subjugation of women associated with the rise of a male priesthood and of a theology in each religion generally determined by males. And that, I think, has been the crucial issue in the treatment of women in religion, that with the passage of time, with the rise of a priesthood, with the development of a theology, religions tended to assign greater value to the men than to the women. For example, in the Talmud, we find this statement, Blessed art thou, O Lord, who has not made me a Gentile, an idiot, or a woman, in the Talmud. And in Corinthians, in the New Testament, women should keep silence in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as even the law says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. It is shameful for a woman to speak in church. The Christian theologians condemned women. Tertullian, in the second century AD, condemned women for the crucifixion of Christ because he said that women have their nature originating with Eve. Eve seduced Adam from the exalted purpose of his life. This gave rise to original sin. As a consequence of original sin, Christ had to be crucified and descended into hell for three days. So he blames womankind for the crucifixion of Christ. And a passage from Tertullian says to women, the sentence of God on this sex of yours lives in this age. The guilt must of necessity live too. You are the devil's gateway. You are she who persuaded him whom the devil was not valiant enough to attack. And so on. One of the church councils in 585 AD said, If women have souls, they must be inferior to those of men, like the souls of beasts. The record of Islam, as it deviated from its original teachings with its rise of ecclesiastical structure and theology, is no more exalted than that of Christianity. Generally, contemporary Muslim theologians have formulated a view of women which is based upon three principles. One, that biological differences such as menstruation cause inequality of women in relation to men. Secondly, that the male sex drive is uncontrollable and hence women should be secluded in everyday life. And thirdly, that the male has authority in the home. So we find with the resurgence of Muslim fundamentalism that present-day Islamic law is becoming more and more discriminatory towards women, not only in their seclusion, in the use of the veil, the restriction of rights of education, but in the legal structure. For example, in one Muslim country, today, if a woman accuses a man of rape and it's not proven, she herself is then charged with adultery. I read recently about a blind, pregnant teenager in a Muslim country who was sentenced to 15 lashes and three years in prison because she was unable to prove that she had been raped. Difficult to prove because she was blind. This traditional view 
of the suppression of women, of the denial of their rights, is to some extent resurgent in the world today with the rise of fundamentalism in Christianity, in Islam, in Hinduism and in other religions. Now let's look at the contemporary scene. Over the last hundred years we find a dual perspective. On the one hand, there are significant developments in the move to equality, yet on the other hand, there are deficiencies which still exist, which provide an arena for the Baha'i community and the Baha'i teachings to play an important role. There have been moves towards equality, for example, in education, the development of women's colleges, co-education in universities in the 19th and 20th centuries has provided a great impetus to equality. When Baha'u'llah passed away in 1892, no country in the world gave women voting rights equal to those of men. In no country of the world were women given the vote in 1892 when Baha'u'llah passed away. And in subsequent years, beginning with New Zealand in 1893 and Australia in 1902 and then other countries after that, gradually nearly all the countries of the world which allow any form of voting have given some degree of voting rights to women. It's interesting that in the United States, as early as 1848, a women's rights convention produced a declaration calling for the sacred right to the elective franchise to be granted to women, although it was almost 80 years before that was brought into effect. In employment, there have obviously been great strides forward in the opportunities for women in employment, in professions that are open to them, although there is, of course, still resistance in the traditional professions such as medicine and law, the physical sciences. <coughs> Lest we become too self-satisfied with the progress that has been made to the emancipation of women over the last hundred years, we should also consider what are some of the present-day deficiencies. For example, the United Nations in 1980 determined that women, who of course are one half the world's population, do two-thirds of the work in the world. They get one-tenth of the income, own one one-hundredth of the world's property, and they are two-thirds of the world's illiterates. So obviously there are still great deficiencies. Female infanticide continues today in India and China. The shameful practice of female genital mutilation continues in many areas of the world. Wife burning in India is not uncommon when the wife produces insufficient dowry. And so on. The rise of fundamentalism I've referred to, there are many other such issues. The Baha'i International Community in New York in 1984 surveyed 70 national spiritual assemblies of the world asking their views about the status of women in their countries. And the response from these 70 national spiritual assemblies showed that this traditional inequality existed in almost all nations. Male dominance in decision-making, restriction on freedom of women to travel, the machismo superiority attitude, the lack of appreciation of women's opinion in discussions. There are still major barriers to promotion in the workplace. Women tend to occupy the lower paid and less influential positions in most organizations. With the rise of vice in declining societies around the world, the position of women has been further jeopardized the rise of pornography, the alliance of pornography and violence, the use of sexist advertising, the victimization of women by criminals and psychopaths, the fear of rape, the forcing of women into prostitution because of lack of employment opportunities. 
women being identified as a scapegoat for unemployment, for marriage breakdown and child delinquency. All of these are examples of the deficiencies which still exist in the present day in the treatment of women. Before turning to the Baha'i teachings, let us briefly look at the role of women historically in the family. Almost all human societies thus far have defined the man to be the head of the household and this term has been interpreted in this way that the wife is to be obedient to the husband, the male dominates in decision making and the wife is mainly confined to the home. For example, in Christianity we find in Ephesians Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. And we find similar practices in the other societies of the world. The female reaction to this male domination in the home has been of two kinds. One kind is submissive acceptance, even playing up to it, the so-called helpless female syndrome that one reads about from time to time, and the other form has been suppressed rebellion through antagonism, through attempting to destroy the image of the husband with the children, through backbiting and the like, all of these reactions to male domination within the home. One of the tragic features of human society has been the enforcement of male domination within the home by the use of physical force and its extreme form in wife beating. And most human societies seem to have been tainted with the stigma of this practice in distant times and in contemporary times. British common law in the 19th century authorized a husband, quote, to chastise his wife with any reasonable instrument. Later the courts were called upon to define what they meant by a legal, by a reasonable instrument and they defined it to be a rod no thicker than a man's thumb. In other words, a man could chastise his wife provided he used a rod, a piece of wood, no thicker than his thumb. In 1871, courts in the United States decided it was time to rescind an ancient privilege. And that ancient privilege was that of the right of the man to beat his wife with a stick, to pull her hair, choke her, spit in her face, or kick her about the floor, or to inflict upon her like indignities. These are passages quoted from the ruling of a United States court in 1871. They said the time has come for us to start rescinding this kind of practice. And as I'm sure many of you are well aware, wife beating is not unknown in the present day. I was reading recently a report of a court case in New York State where a woman was convicted of killing her husband and in the trial it came out that he had kicked her downstairs, he'd locked her in the trunk of the car, he'd held her under a scalding shower and burnt her with cigarettes. The end of that over a period of years she killed him and she's now serving a prison term of 15 years to life. So Wife beating is a problem which exists in the present day as well as the distant past. A recent sociological study of wife beating came to this conclusion, quote, full sexual equality is essential for the prevention of wife beating. Now with that survey complete, let us turn to an examination of the Baha'i teachings on this very important and quite complex subject. The Guardian says the position of women in the Baha'i teachings is not only legal 
but also spiritual and educational. And we can consider these teachings under several categories. Firstly, the intrinsic principle of equality. And I will quote from a number of passages, most of which are found in the compilation on women recently issued by the Universal House of Justice and prepared by the Research Department at the Baha'i World Center. Firstly, on the principle of equality, there are statements, for example, of Baha'u'llah, where he says, in this day the hand of divine grace has removed all distinctions. The servants of God and his handmaidens are regarded on the same plane. And Abdul Baha refers to men and women and says, from the spiritual viewpoint, there is no difference between them. So our statements in our religious writings are very clear and explicit. From the spiritual viewpoint, there is no difference between men and women. In another place, Abdul Baha refers to the world of humanity as having two parts, male and female, and says each is the complement of the other. From the spiritual viewpoint, no difference. In practical consequence, each is the complement of the other. There are statements where the writings call upon men and women to avoid exaltation of one over the other and which state that the laws should be equally applicable to men and to women. Secondly, the Baha'i teachings on marriage and on the family. Here we find an important and significant difference between the Baha'i teachings and the practice in human societies around the world for centuries and probably for millennia. Because in our religion, the relationship in marriage and within the family is to be based upon equality with consultation without domination of one over the other. Let me read some passages. The House of Justice said, The atmosphere within a Baha'i family, as within the community as a whole, should express the keynote of the cause of God which the beloved guardian has stated is not dictatorial authority, but humble fellowship, not arbitrary power, but the spirit of frank and loving consultation. In another place, the House of Justice referred to decision-making between husband and wife. They said, Family consultation employing full and frank discussion animated by awareness of the need for moderation and balance, can be the panacea for domestic conflict. Wives should not attempt to dominate their husbands, nor husbands their wives. Note the contrast between this and the male domination in decision-making, which has been a feature of marriage down through the ages. On this point of consultation, we as Baha'is are familiar with Baha'i consultation in a larger setting where the majority view applies. What happens in a marriage where there is husband and wife and consultation is occurring? How are decisions to be made? The House of Justice said, There are times when a wife should defer to her husband and times when a husband should defer to his wife but neither should ever unjustly dominate the other. In another place, the House of Justice further clarified this point by saying exactly under what circumstances such deference should take place is a matter for each couple to decide. The House of Justice has found it necessary on at least one occasion to write about family violence and wife beating. And let me read to you the statement of the House of Justice on this subject. Violence in the family is antithetical to the spirit of the faith and a practice to be condemned. If the broad structure of society is to remain intact, resolute efforts including medical ones as necessary, should be made to curb acts 
of aggression within families, particularly their extreme forms of wife-beating and child abuse by parents. Baha'u'llah himself, in one passage, has referred to the importance of avoiding tyranny of women by men. And again, let me read that passage. Baha'u'llah states, The friends of God must be adorned with the ornament of justice, equity, kindness and love, as they do not allow themselves to be the subject of cruelty and transgression in like manner they should not allow such tyranny to visit the handmaidens of God. Woman has the primary responsibility of being the first educator of the child, just as man has the primary responsibility of being the breadwinner of the family. If that was all there were to the Baha'i teachings, our position would be quite traditional. Woman in the home, man outside as breadwinner. But that is not all. There is provision in the Baha'i writings for role flexibility. And it states very clearly that the place of woman is not confined to the home. Let me read a passage from the House of Justice. The House of Justice states, The concept of a Baha'i family is based on the principle that the man has primary responsibility for the financial support of the family and the woman is the chief and primary educator of the children. This by no means implies that these functions are inflexibly fixed and cannot be changed and adjusted to suit particular family situations. Nor does it mean that the place of woman is confined to the home. Rather, while primary responsibility is assigned, it is anticipated that fathers would play a significant role in the education of the children and women could also be breadwinners. So our teachings allow for a significant degree of role flexibility, far more than exists in traditional societies. The role of women in society in the Baha'i teachings arises from the fact that our teachings call for an identical curriculum for girls as for boys. Traditionally, in most Western societies, the boys study physical sciences and the girls do domestic science or domestic arts. An identical curriculum would mean that the girls also would study the physical sciences and the boys also would study domestic arts. And there would be a greater capability and a greater preparation for the world of the future. The writings identify special areas where women can play a significant role. For example, Abdu'l-Bahá speaks of women entering confidently and capably the great arena of laws and politics and says that is important for war to cease. In another place, Abdul Baha says, woman must especially devote her energies and abilities towards the industrial and agricultural sciences, seeking to assist mankind in that which is most needful. So these and other passages disclose our larger view of the role of women outside the home, in industry, agriculture, law, politics, and other areas. And the House of Justice has stated in the Tablet of the World, Baha'u'llah himself has envisaged that women as well as men would be breadwinners. And there are other passages which identify in the Baha'i teachings the legitimacy of the role of women as income producers and calls upon women to determine how best they can fulfill that together with the responsibilities of motherhood. The House of Justice states, it is for every woman, if and when she becomes a mother, to determine how best she can discharge on the one hand her chief responsibility as a mother, on the other to the extent possible to participate in other aspects of the activities of the society of which she forms a part. 
so much for some of the Baha'i teachings on the equality of men and women. There are two other teachings, though, I would like to mention. Our teachings on sexual morality provide a wonderful protection to women as well as to men to freely mix in the day-to-day activities of society outside the home, in social mixing, in business, in professions, in schools and the like without the problems, for example, of sexual harassment which has become quite a problem to a number of women in their involvement in the larger society and so our teachings on sexual morality liberate both men and women for this larger interaction in the broader dimensions of society. And we, I think, should not fail to mention the importance of the covenant because the covenant is a protection to women in many ways. Through the infallibility of the universal house of justice, the faith is protected from corruption and the legislation of the house of justice will authentically express the spirit of equality in our teachings. Another dimension of the covenant is that it avoids the establishment of a priesthood when we have seen historically that a priesthood has been so detrimental to the rights of women. Much more than that, it avoids institutions of the faith perpetuating behavior of a priestly nature, acting like priests, making dogmatic statements which would then be from a fallible perspective and could reflect a prejudice against women. So the covenant is in many ways a vital protection to women. Let me now turn more specifically to the question of women and peace. The history of the 19th and 20th centuries indicates that there has been a significant alliance between the efforts of women to gain emancipation, to gain the right to vote, to participate in society, and their concern for peace. Let me take just one example. The Women's Peace Festival, held on the 2nd of June, 1873, well over 100 years ago held in large cities in the United States and Europe. It arose from an organization of women who were appalled at the degree of suffering that occurred in the Franco-Prussian War, formed a women's organization to promote the Women's Peace Festival to bring about peace. And this festival of 1873 called for the following measures. One, the abolition of war through general disarmament. The formation of a Congress of Nations with compulsory jurisdiction over the nations of the world. The abolition of the sale of liquor as a disturber of peace. The prohibition of the sale and carrying of deadly weapons. The removal of inequality based on sex, colour or race. And the identification of the role of women to protest against war and to offer arbitration for the settlement of disputes. Over 100 years ago, women, a women's organization in North America and Europe, was calling for international government to bring about general disarmament of the nations of the world and compulsory arbitration to settle international disputes. This Women's Peace Festival ultimately fell into division due to disunity over the issue of American military policy toward the American Indians in the 19th century, but it led to a number of organizations which persist to the present day. For example, the Women's Peace Party associated with Jane Addams, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the Women's Peace Session of 1921. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom made proposals to the 1919 peace conference in Paris at the conclusion of World War I. They made a number of proposals to bring about a lasting peace. These proposals were rejected by the 1919 peace conference. 
One of the people present at that conference was a man called Gunnar Jan. In 1946, 27 years later, he was part of the Nobel Institute in Scandinavia, which awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to Emily Balk for her work with, Inter with Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And at that time, he made this statement. He said, I want to say so much. It would have been extremely wise if the promotion, proposal the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom made to the conference in 1919 had been accepted by the conference. But few of the men listened to what the women had to say. The atmosphere was too bitter and revengeful. On top of this was the fact that the proposal was made by women. In our patriarchal world, suggestions which come from women are seldom taken seriously. And Gunnar Jan concluded with these words, Sometimes it would be wise of the men to spare their condescending smiles. So, my point is simply to indicate that women have been associated with the achievement of peace in a very significant way in the 19th and 20th century. Now, what can we say about the Baha'i approach to peace and to the alliance between the equality of men and women and the achievement of peace? I think it rests upon three major principles. The first of these is our principle of the organic unit. And this is a familiar concept to most Baha'is. We believe that the kind of society we want to form it, through the Baha'i administrative order is an organic unit, is like a living being, interconnected, the welfare of each element interactively relating to the welfare of the whole. And this is very relevant to the question of the equality of men and women. Because our teachings indicate, firstly, that peace requires unity. In order to have peace, we must have unity. This unity implies oneness of mankind. If we don't have oneness of mankind, we don't have a basic unity, we don't have peace. And equality of men and women is fundamental for the oneness of mankind. It is not just a question of relationship between races or segments of society. It is also a question of relationship between men and women. So in that sense, the equality of men and women is a basic element of the formation of an organic unit of human society with all the spiritual powers which our teachings identify with the organic unit. The House of Justice, in its statement on peace, indicates that inequality produces harmful attitudes in men which transfer to the larger society. And this is a concept stated also by Abdu'l-Bahá in several places. For example, Abdu'l-Bahá says, as long as women are prevented from attaining their highest possibilities, so long will men be unable to achieve the greatness which might be theirs. And referring to men and women, he says, if one is defective, the other will necessarily be incomplete and perfections cannot be attained. If either proves defective, the defect will naturally extend to the other. So, what I get from these passages is if women are denied equality, men also are prevented from achieving their fullest development, or as Abdu'l-Bahá says, men are prevented from achieving the greatness which might be theirs. So in a very real sense, men are held hostage to women. That if the male segment of our population denies equality to women, then those males are themselves prevented from fulfilling their potential, from realizing what Abdu'l-Bahá describes as the greatness which might be theirs. 
Abdul Baha in many places refers to the important role to be played by mothers in the achievement of peace. And he refers to the fact that mothers will not willingly send their sons to war to be shot down and mercilessly killed for some cause over the territoriality or the like after those sons have been reared for 20 or so years. And I think there are deeper significances which go beyond simply the sending of sons to war. That motherhood involves unselfish action in nurturing and caring for others. It involves the sacrifice of oneself to the individual embryo growing within and the feeding of this new creation with one's own milk, with the product of one's own body, so that the very process of motherhood gives rise to the sense of unselfishness, the sense of nurturance and caring for others, rather than the sense of dominance and control. And what the world needs for the achievement of peace is this greater sense of nurturance and a lesser sense of dominance. And this may also be another element to the important role that women will play in the achievement and preservation of peace. Let me conclude now by briefly mentioning some of the elements that I find within the Baha'i writings to guide us in implementing the Baha'i principle of the equality of men and women. What guidelines should we use? What things should we be careful of? What should we avoid? What should we do in order to bring about the equality of men and women? And I think there are five basic principles. The first is that we are enjoined in our writings to avoid the use of force or demonstrations. Abdul Baha says, demonstrations of force such as are now taking place in England are neither becoming nor effective in the cause of womanhood and equality. Our approach is not through the use of force. The second principle, I think, is a recognition that any change is evolutionary. We would desire to be instantaneous, to occur overnight, but that's not the way humans work. It is evolutionary. The House of Justice, in a statement on their behalf, wrote, The principle of the equality between women and men, like the other teachings of the faith, can be effectively and universally established among the friends when it is pursued in conjunction with all other aspects of Baha'i life. Change is an evolutionary process requiring patience with oneself and others, loving education, and the passage of time as the believers deepen their knowledge of the faith, gradually discard long-held traditional attitudes and progressively conform their lives to the unifying teachings of the cause. Patience, evolution, gradual development, loving education, the passage of time, patience with oneself and others. A third principle is the need to avoid contention between men and women. Abdul Baha referred to a women's assemblage formed by the Baha'i women of Iran for the promotion of knowledge. And in writing advice to that assemblage, he said, it should be done in such a way that differences will day by day be entirely wiped out. Not that, God forbid, it will end in argumentation between men and women. In brief, ye should now engage in matters of pure spirituality and not contend with men. And I think we have seen in the larger society the futility and sterility of the polarization of antagonism between men and women on this issue and we are told in our teachings we must avoid this. Our writings tell us that a great responsibility rests upon men to encourage women and to eradicate the male assumption of superiority. 
Abdul Baha says, the assumption of superiority by man will continue to be depressing to the ambition of woman, as if her attainment to equality was creationally impossible. Woman's aspiration towards advancement will be checked by it and she will gradually become hopeless. On the contrary, we must declare her capacity is equal, even greater than man's. This will inspire her with hope and ambition. So my understanding of this passage is that men have a great responsibility to offer sincere and genuine and constructive encouragement to women in all areas of development and advancement and to eliminate what Abdul Baha describes as the assumption of superiority by man. And the final principle is the importance of women striving through their own efforts at self development and accomplishment. Abdul Baha says woman must endeavour to attain greater perfection, to be man's equal in every respect, to make progress in all in which she has been backward, so that man will be compelled to acknowledge her equality of capacity and attainment. And I think these five principles underlie a constructive Baha'i approach to the implementation of this principle of equality of men and women which can bring the Baha'i community so much renown in the world. I'd like to conclude my presentation tonight by reading to you a poem called The Seeker, written by a Baha'i Gertrude Robinson and published in a Baha'i World volume about 40 to 45 years ago. And I read this poem because although the title is The Seeker, I believe it expresses very clearly and very eloquently the aspirations of women which we as Baha'is are committed to the support and nurturance of. So I conclude with this poem. There must be a loveliness I have not known, else hunger would not be so deep. Despair would crush me, but this yearning passion for the altitudes beyond my ken knows but one answer, full completion. No cry can be so faint, but finds response somewhere in all infinity, and so my soul shall keep its inner urge to scale the unseen heights and breathe the unimagined airs of rarefied and mystic climes. Somewhere all beauty waits beyond the seven valleys of the soul, and naught shall keep my hungry heart from seeking through the endless reach of all eternity the loveliness my heart has never known. Thank you.